and that is Bobby Fuller and the four. Now, to me, you know, similar to Buddy Holly, but you know what? That was his idol, so, I mean, of course you're going to sound like your idols, and to me, there's nothing better than sounding like Buddy Holly. So, but let's not dwell on his musical genius. We're here to talk about his death, which is very mysterious. It's something I've been pondering for a while now. A couple of things that just didn't make sense to me, but I think I kind of figured it out, hopefully. So Bobby Fuller was 23 years old when he died on July 18, 1966 in Los Angeles, California. So I've been on this Los Angeles kick for a while. A lot of strange things going on out there. Or used to be, <laughs> probably still is. But uh, Bobby Fuller was an up and coming rock and roll star. His sound, like I said, was like Buddy Holly. He was from uh, El Paso, Texas. So, I mean, he had that Texas twang to him. But uh, he had a lot of the, uh, I want to say, Richie Valens type of sound to him as well, which is ironic because I think. Richie Valens was also signed to the same record label that Bobby Fuller was. But let's get down to the, the crux of this case. Well, Bobby Fuller had a hit song, which was I Fought the Law. Now, what a lot of people don't know is I Fought the Law was actually written by um, uh, Sonny Curtis, who was a member of the Crickets with Buddy Holly. I don't think Buddy Holly ever recorded the song. Uh, he was gone during that time period when Sonny Curtis wrote it and they, the Crickets recorded it. But regardless, Bobby Fuller made it a hit and it was his number one biggest hit. But when he moved from Texas to Los Angeles, uh, he was looking to be the next big thing. But on July 18th, something happened. And his body was found out in front of his apartment complex in his mother's Oldsmobile, slumped in the front seat. Now, you got to remember the, I, I don't know the year of the car, but back then they were all bench seats mostly. So he was down and there was a can of gasoline on the floorboard and it had a hose attached to it like a rubber uh, a hose there was reports that he was beat up there was blood and his finger may have been broken and he was drenched in gasoline the original cause of death was suicide. Not long later, I'm talking within a year, I think, it was changed from suicide to accidental. Now, this is one of those cases where I'm going to have to sit here and talk this out with you guys. So what I want you to do is see where I'm going with this. And if it makes sense to you, let's start first, uh, like we always do, though, with victimology. Especially when you're looking at suicide, you want to know, hey, is the guy suicidal? Well, listen, I've done a lot of cases where people think that it isn't suicide, and it is. I worked for a senator one time. He hired me about his daughter's death and didn't believe it was a suicide, and he swore up and down it wasn't, and... When I looked at it, it was clear-cut suicide to me, and I gave them every indication why. They still wouldn't accept it. And that's okay. That's okay. I understand that. But that happens a lot. A lot. So just because when you talk to the family members and friends and they say, well, Bobby Fuller wasn't suicidal, uh, you don't know that. You don't know that. People say Robin Williams wasn't suicidal. There, there, there's a... Chris Cornell. I mean, you can have your opinions about that. Same with um, Kurt Cobain. I mean, 
you don't know what's going inside the head of somebody. You really don't. A lot of times when people commit suicide, they don't want to worry their loved ones, so they're not going to tell them that they're thinking about it. Sometimes they won't even leave a note. They'll just do it. Okay, it happens. Now, I'm not saying that's the case here or in Kurt Cobain or, or any of them. I don't know. I haven't looked at them, but I'm just saying peripherally. So you can't dismiss Bobby Fuller's death as not being a suicide just based off of people saying he was not suicidal. By all indications, he seemed very happy. Again, he was up and coming. Yet, after his hit signal, sing, signal, single, I fought the law, and the law won. He had another album that did not do so, so well. Hey, that happens too. Are you going to kill yourself because of it? Maybe some people are. Uh, right off the top of my head, I just think of like Candlebox. You remember that band? Great first album in the early 90s. I want to say 94, 93. Second album, not so good. Um, Slaughter with Mark Slaughter. Remember that? First album, great. Second one, not so great. Subsequent ones, not even worse. So, I mean, it happens. Uh, but maybe this bothered him a little bit more than usual because... He had just canceled a show, and I believe it was in San Francisco, in which some people lost some money. Now, when there's a death, we all that we know that it's either natural, you know, accidental, suicide, or homicide. You know, it's our job as investigators to try to figure out which one it is. So. We cannot rule out suicide yet, just based off of victimology and things we know. He seemed to be happy. He didn't have a steady girlfriend, but he had somebody he was seeing. There was rumors that she was tied into the mob. Um, listen, with famous cases especially, you are always going to have rumors. And they feed in, okay? You have to strip out those rumors. Get rid of them. They don't matter. Yes, I'm saying they don't matter. Now you're sitting there, some of you conspiracy theorists, and saying, well, they all matter. You have to... Listen, they don't matter. They will matter if we come to a part of the investigation that leads us down that road. Until that time, they don't matter. What you have to focus on is victimology, his death... What the actual crime scene in the car a little bit on statistics and by that I mean okay if you're saying that he died by suicide and the suicide measure is actually gas inhalation asphyxia well let's check out the statistics on that and see how many people actually number one died through uh, inhalation of gas. Two, let's break that down even further to how many people died from inhaling gas and committed suicide. Well, I would not be the investigator I am if I didn't already have the answers to that. And the answers are very little. Now, natural gas, the kind that is pumped into your stove and uh, heating in the house. Yes, that happens. But gas, fuel, to die of that gas inhalation is very rare. It happens, but not very often. And in fact, I have some experience personally, not me, with individuals that I know inhale gas on a regular basis. Now, remember, I used to work at a, at a juvenile group home. Gas is, I guess you could say, people like to say gateway drug. That's what they say marijuana was, blah, blah, blah. It's not. You experiment with the different things, and you'll start off with the most easiest thing that you can get a hold of. Sometimes it's a pen, you know, one of those markers. 
Then it progresses to aerosol cans and gas cans and marijuana and whatever they get their hands on. But I know people that sniff gas a lot. A lot. Where it messed up their mind. You know how many died of that? That I know of? Big fat zero. Doesn't mean it doesn't happen. I'm just saying it's odd. Now... The biggest clue that we need to look at is his body and how it is found, what is going on with it. Now, I read, I can only read like one and a half pages of the autopsy report. I'd like to get it all. I know it's out there. I did read the death certificate as well. And, well... Before I get into that, I I just skipped over a, a huge section, which we need to talk about before we can get into this, right? After victimology, I always do the timeline, right? Sorry. I don't know where my mind is today. Timeline. Very important. Before we get into the big clue, which is the, the crime scene itself, if it is a crime scene. He's at home in his apartment with his mom. Two different accounts. I read that his mom was visiting him. The other one is his mom was living there with him. Regardless, she was there. He received a phone call at like 2.30 in the morning. What I'd like to know, was he asleep or was he awake when this phone call took place? Because he left. He said, I got to go somewhere. I'll be back. Now, if he was asleep and he left... That tells me one thing. It tells me that he wasn't expecting a call, and it was something of an urgent nature that he left, right? If he's awake and he gets that call and leaves, well, maybe he was already expecting that call. See how the little things like that are very important? So you as an investigator on scene and you're talking to his mom, you don't leave with just the answer. He received a phone call and left. Well, do you know who it was? No, I don't. Okay, thank you. You got to go deeper because it means a lot more. Hey, was he asleep? What was he wearing? Was he in his pajamas? Was he dressed up? Things like that. Did he have his shoes on? Very important. So I'd want to know those things, but we don't know them. At least I don't know them. All I know is he got a phone call at 2.30 and he left. I'm assuming she went to sleep and she wakes up. He's not there. She says she keeps checking the parking lot for the car. The car never shows up until 5.15 p.m. She goes out to check the mail. She sees the car there. Some reason, she goes out to check the car. I would want to know that. Hey, you see the car. Why are you going out there? Is it because he hasn't come into the house? What's the reason? Why would you decide to go out and check it? She goes out, opens the front seat, or looks in the front seat, and she sees her son... Bobby Fuller, dead on the front seat. She knows it, notices a pungent odor of gasoline. So your, your time frame is 2.30 in the morning, right? Until 5 p.m. in the afternoon. That's a pretty big time gap. Now, the biggest thing is I said about the vehicle and the the body obviously in the vehicle but the vehicle itself i have a hard time with the vehicle not being there all those hours and then showing up with a body in it okay to the lay person or just common knowledge you're going to say to yourself well he a dead man can't drive himself to back to his apartment he was already dead. Yes, I would agree with that. But I have a harder time believing this. Well, maybe not a harder time. Pretty hard for a dead person to drive back. But I have a very, 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 very hard time believing if this man was murdered, that he was killed off-site, meaning off out of that apartment grounds, whoever did it, placed him back in the car, 
poured gas on them, placed the gas can in the car, drove that back with that smell and everything, and parked it there. Didn't happen. Think about that. That does not make sense. Let's take out the gas part about it. Let's say Bobby Fuller gets a call at 2.30 and he goes to, what, what, what would make you leave your house at 2.30 in the morning? What, women, right? Us guys. If a woman calls you at that time, you know, depending on the woman, you're going to go. That's my first thought. Two, friend. Male, female, doesn't matter. Friend calls you. Hey, if you're restless, if you want to do something, you go. Or if that friend needs help, you go. I think about the gas can and how that comes into play. Whose gas can was it? The mom should know that. Inexplicably, the police threw away the gas can, took it out of the car and threw it in a dumpster. It was witnessed by Bobby Fuller's manager who was there. Do I have a problem with it being thrown away? Yes, I do. Yes, I do. At the very least, very least, I'm not even talking about fingerprinting, looking for latent prints, photograph. Please tell me they photographed the scene, the car, as it was. I would hope they had done that. If they didn't, that's a, that's a travesty of justice. Even if it was suicide, you still have to document it. All right, let's get back to my scenario. Even if the gas was not involved... Let's say Bobby Fuller leaves his house after getting a phone call. He goes to wherever he goes and he's murdered or it's an accidental death. It doesn't matter. Even suicide, let's say. Why? Why would somebody place him back into his vehicle, drive that vehicle to his apartment building? That doesn't make sense. I'm taking out the gas completely. Why would somebody do that? The only reason you would do that is because you knew the person and you knew the connection that they had with their mother and you knew that she was there and you're driving it there in order for the body to be discovered. That's the only reason you do that. I don't see that in this case, so that's. And I'll tell you why I don't see that in this case. That's so risky. Okay, let's say at 3.30 in the morning, 4 a.m. in the morning, 5 a.m. in the morning, you drive the car there with a body in it. That's not as risky, right? Not as risky. It's still, there's an elevated risk. But you're talking broad daylight. Broad daylight. Five in the afternoon. You're going to drive a car there with a body in it and park it there and get out and hope nobody sees you. Why? Why would you do that? That makes zero sense. Justice. It's my dog again. Not snoring this time, bathing himself. I'm sure you heard that lapping. What are you doing up there? It's not bath time. Gotta love dogs. Luckily, justice doesn't take me away from my train of thought here. It doesn't make sense. If it doesn't make sense, then it didn't happen. Nobody drove that car back with a body in it. No. I don't believe that for a minute. Let me tell you what I do believe, though. He was, see, he was seeing somebody or went and saw somebody, yes, with a phone call. But whoever 
was responsible, if there was somebody responsible and it wasn't suicide, it was somebody from that apartment complex. Okay? They're, you're looking too far out. You got to narrow your scope. It makes sense that it happened there. Because you're eliminating the possibility that somebody would drive that car. And they wouldn't. And I'm saying again, you throw the gas into it. And let's say they drive Bobby Fuller's body back to the apartment complex. Then douse him with gas and leave the gas in there. Yeah. Okay. That's a little... I get that a little bit, but it still makes no sense because why would you do that? If you kill Bobby Fuller somewhere else, why not just leave him there? Or drive, if it's a crowded area, you drive 100 yards up the road. Why well, take him all the way to his house, to his apartment? That makes zero sense. Now, let me tell you what I think happened. And, and again, this is just off of a preliminary, you know, digging. You know, there's mafia-related things that... And his manager having a life insurance policy on him and all that. Let's, again, you're searching for a motive when you don't have to search for a motive. Listen, when somebody dies, you, could, you can come up with a hundred different motives... As, as to why you think it is, and then chase it backwards. And that's not what, that's not how professional investigations are done. Okay, you look at the scene, you see what you have, you start deducing possibilities to probabilities. What it tells me is Bobby Fuller was with somebody there at that apartment complex. Okay. There was some sort of, there were, let's say this, I don't believe it was suicide, okay? Let's get that out, okay? I'm sorry that I didn't announce that sooner. I'm sure you could tell by my tone I probably don't believe that. But it's certainly one that I looked into because the mom was quoted as saying he was despondent. Well, you dig a little further than that and you find out that the mom didn't actually say that. Uh, that was misconstrued. Upset. Well, big deal. I'm upset. I'm upset every day. If you find me dead tomorrow, it ain't suicide. So don't go to the paper and say, well, he said he was he was upset. He was despondent. <laughs> I'm not. Okay? Relax your shoulders. Take a deep breath and look at things with clear eyes. No bias, no black clouds of rumors. You have an individual dead in his mom's car, slumped over, gas can in the front seat. He's doused in gas. It's not suicide. Now, his injuries are obviously very, very important in determining what happened to him. The brother who saw the body said there was a cut on his head. There was petechial hemorrhaging of the chest, neck, and I want to say eyes. That is indicative of somebody being strangled. I'm gonna I'm not sure about the eyes. I'm not sure if that's I don't have eyes written down here. I have petechial hemorrhaging and bruising on his shoulders. Now could that bruising be from a previous incident? I guess, but when it says excessive, excessive bruising. It's not suicide. It's not an accident. This is a homicide, from what I see. No, again, I wasn't on scene. You know what I mean? It's very hard, it, and I don't like that. Sometimes 
people, you know, you weren't there. I wasn't there. I didn't see it. The cops did. Yet. Bobby Fuller's brother was there. Bobby Fuller's mother was there. Bobby Fuller's manager was there. They all saw it. So if they say that it looked like he was beat up, you know, I'd like to see the police report to see what that says. But let me tell you what I think happened. Okay, let's finally get into this. He gets a phone call at 2.30. I don't know if that phone call was from somebody in the apartment building or outside. That I don't know. But at some point, he makes his way back to that apartment building. He doesn't go home. Maybe it's because he's partying. I don't know. I don't know what the reason is for it. But he ends up with somebody at that apartment building. And the altercation occurs there in that apartment complex. And, yeah, he was, he was placed in his car, in that car by somebody at the apartment complex. He was beat up and placed there. Now, why would they do that? Why place him back in his car? The only reason is because if you place him anywhere else from where he actually expired from, it points the finger at that person, right? If it's in apartment A, you can't leave him in apartment A because that's your apartment. You can't leave him right outside your door, so you have to place him somewhere else. It would also tell me, possibly, that the offender didn't have a vehicle. Now, I'd want to know whether the keys were accessible to Bobby Fuller's vehicle. But regardless, what is the, the introduction of the gasoline? Could Bobby Fuller been getting high by sniffing gas? Sure, but I don't think so in this case. The reason I consider it is because it's in his car and the windows are rolled up and it's in July in Los Angeles. It's hot. And it maximizes the effect of the odor, you know, the intoxicants of the gas. He can't do that in his apartment, right? He, you know, his mom would smell it. So you do it out in your car. But it's her car, and that gas smell is going to be there. Now, if he was intoxicated, let's say he was drinking, and then he decided to do it, he's not going to be of the soundest judgment, and I get that. Yet, I don't think that's what happened. I think the introduction of the gas is by somebody who intended on lighting him on fire after he was dead. I think there, there was an altercation. He was dead, he was dragged into his car, and he was doused with gasoline. And the other gas was set in the car. And why, what, why didn't it happen? You don't have to dig too deep. Maybe it's as simple as this. The guy didn't have a lighter. The guy didn't have matches. That simple. Didn't, wasn't planned. It's not premeditated murder. It happened. You're in a panic, throw him in the car, go to set him on fire, you know. I don't I don't have any matches. I'm not I don't even smoke. So if I was looking for an offender, I would be looking for somebody in that apartment complex. I would say that didn't smoke, but that isn't necessarily true. He could smoke, he could have left everything up on his apartment on the table. Uh, and he didn't want to come back down because maybe somebody heard something. It can be that simple, folks. But regardless, I just don't see that it was a suicide. Not with the injuries that he had, the excessive bruising and the petechial hemorrhaging. I also read that initially gas had been poured down his throat, but... That had been refuted later. There was rumor that he had, was going to an LSD, an acid party. But he had no drugs in his system. Now, he could have went to that party. And something happened there. Yeah. Again, I think we've deduced. 
I don't believe that. Because there's no reason to drive him back to his apartment. It, it, it makes no sense. Think of this. When somebody kills somebody, let's say uh, a husband kills his wife. Where do they take the car? A lot of times. To an airport. Why? It blends in. Number two, they can say, well, her body's never been found. She got on a flight and she's gone. How many times do you take it to a loved one's residence? Let's say you kill your wife and dispose. Let's say you don't dispose of the body. You just put it in the trunk and drive it to your in-law's house, right? That doesn't make sense. It doesn't make sense. What makes sense is something happened at that apartment complex. I would have interviewed every single person at that complex in 1966. Uh, I think you would have found your answers there. You have a big star, up and coming star. So you want to look at money, right? Everybody wants to look at money wants to look at the mafia to a lesser extent you know a scorned lover now i i would certainly look at him meeting a woman a married woman or something like that and the boyfriend giving him a beating and and killed him I, I could see that. But again, I think it's within that complex. You don't have to look much further than that. So that's what I think happened here with Bobby Fuller. I'd like the police reports. I'd like the full autopsy report. But uh, again, you start deducing. Like you, I always say, you start off with so many possibilities but then you just start deducing what makes sense. The car driven back doesn't make sense. So then where are you looking? You know, the apartment complex. Okay, within the apartment complex, what are you looking for? Well, I'm looking for maybe somebody that's married, girlfriend's a little flirtatious, seen hanging around Bobby, things like that. You start deducing possibilities to probabilities. That's how you find your killer. So, sad case of Bobby Fuller. Usually... I tend to agree a lot of times with these rulings of suicide and accident, but this one I don't. And, the, and especially because of the injuries that, even if he didn't have a broken finger, I've heard that that's been discarded too. Uh, so even taking that out, the excessive bruising on his shoulders, the petechial hemorrhaging, uh, the cut on the head, that doesn't happen if you're inhaling gas. And we've already deduced the inhaling gas is not going to kill you. Not intentionally. I just, I'm not buying that. Statistics don't bear that out. So to me, it's not accident. It's not suicide. To me, this was homicide. Look inside that apartment complex and you'll find your killer. Okay, so today what I want to do is I want to revisit Bobby Fuller. And I know it's only been like a week, but... Some things didn't sit well with me, okay? So when they don't do that, I'm going to address them. And mostly they didn't sit well with me because of my assessment. You know, when you are, I guess, if you love your vocation or whatever it is, your work, your job, um, I equate it sometimes to professional athletes. When you get done playing a game or something and then you go home and you sit and you think, then when you lay down to go to bed, you think more. That happens to me all the time with cold cases. Um, it's because it's my life. You know, that's, it's just what I've been doing for the past 20 years. So this case with Bobby Fuller, I researched it, came up with that assessment about the apartments and, and everything, and I felt good about it. You know, I felt, felt really good. And I, last couple of nights I've been laying in bed and before I go to sleep and thinking about the case and there's some things that didn't make any sense to me. And then there were some tidbits that you guys threw at me in the comment section that, you know, made me pause a little bit and think, you know, how I always say you don't know everything. 
They don't know all the facts. Um, the police don't even know all the facts, but they probably know more than you do. They probably know more than I do about this case. That's why I said it's always important to be there on scene. But a couple of things that don't make sense to me about my assessment. There's a lot of things that don't make sense to me about the case. But I think I was pre... Uh, I just... I don't think I should have made the determination as steadfast as I did. Not about it being, well, yeah, about it being homicide versus suicide. Number one, the biggest uh, thing that I thought on is the autopsy report. And although I didn't read all of it, you know, that the autopsy report was changed from suicide to accidental, but the cause of death, the asphyxiation by gasoline, although I have trouble with that, who am I to question what the medical examiner wrote? He, he knows more about that shit than I do, okay? He probably knows a 9, 10 out of 10, and I know about a 5 out of 10 when it comes to that. You know, if it was my case, I I would certainly give that autopsy report to Cyril Wack or Warner Spitz to get uh, Michael Bodden to get a second opinion. I mean, that's... But I wouldn't give that opinion because it's out of my lane. I'm an investigator. I'm a detective. I'm not a medical student. I never went to medical school. So I shouldn't be... I can still comment on certain things, but I can't be definitive. You know what I mean? If the autopsy report of Bobby Fuller says that he died of inhalation of gas, I have to accept that as fact. I mean, I could question it, sure. You always question it, but you start questioning things like that all the time just to fit your narrative. Uh, I think you become a conspiracy theorist, and I'm certainly not that. I mean, I would have to look at the reputation of this medical examiner, and I know the shoddiness of the police work, supposedly. Um, yes, it was very bad that the gas can was thrown away at the scene, especially because how do you know that it's ruled a suicide right there at the scene? You have to wait till the autopsy reports to come back, but yet you already threw away the gas can? That makes no sense. That's, that's, that's ignorance. That's stupidity. Um, but hindsight's always twenty twenty. So, the autopsy report, if it says he died of inhaling gasoline, I have to abide by that. So, I can't make the assumption that he was murdered. I guess you could if you could say, well, he was murdered by intoxicating fumes. Mm. I mean, then you're, you're pushing, right? You're saying, okay, he was knocked out, placed inside the vehicle, windows rolled up. Um, yeah, I mean, yeah, I, I could see that. But then I don't think you're trying to kill him. I mean, that wouldn't be the intent. The intent would be to scare him, hurt him, um, but not kill him. And then all of a sudden, whoops, he died. Yeah, I, I could see that. Maybe, but I doubt that's why they changed it from suicide to accidental. Him huffing the gas theory has some merit. Now hear me out. He has to do it in his own car. Or his mom's car, the vehicle he has. Now that's another question I'd want to know. Why does he only have his mom's vehicle? Where's his car? He just had a, a hit single. He's got to have money. Now, some people choose not to have a car. Let me tell you something. I've been to L.A. many a times, and if I lived out there, I don't think I'd own a car. But that's now. That wasn't 1966. Now, another thing that, remember in that video that I did on Bobby Fuller, I addressed this. 
in a general scope. I said, it's very important to know how he was dressed. What was he wearing? Those things are very important to know whether he left in a hurry, um, you know, in regards to the phone call. Somebody said that he was wearing his mom's slippers. That's huge. I used to say that all the time on Hunt for the Zodiac, and people would make fun of me all the time. Because I'd always say, that's huge. But I'm going to say it again. That's huge. Right? That shows two things. One, he either left in a, a hurry. Number two, he wasn't going very far. Hence, the apartment complex where I said that this probably took place. Um, or three... He was huffing gas, and he just put on a pair of slippers that were right there. I would think somebody would know whether he would huff gas. His victimology would tell you that. Now, don't talk to his family, okay? I don't know if they'll be truthful about that. And the only reason, nothing against the family is they're trying to protect an image. I understand that. I get it. His friends, his bandmates, those people, they would know that if he was into drugs. Again, autopsy report reported no illegal drugs. <laughs> but him being doused with gas. Now, see, that's something that could be misconstrued, Right? What happens if he was, he's not doused, he's not soaked, but he has splash on him or something. If he was huffing the gas and it spilled on him by mistake. Through the years, could that be misconstrued as being doused? Sure, it could. It's so many minute things that could change the course of this, and it already has. Him wearing the slippers that I just found out, if true. Um, I don't know. I think I was just too quick in my assessment to say it was, without a doubt, homicide. I'm backtracking, yes. And I'm allowed to do that. Investigators, amateurs, you're allowed to do that, it's okay. That's the problem. When new information comes to light and you stick to that theory and you try to make that fit your theory, you're the problem. If something comes in and it points away from your theory, you have to be man enough to own that. Okay? Now, the slipper bit doesn't change my mind on homicide or suicide or accidental. What's changing my mind is the autopsy report. If the autopsy report says he died from inhaling those fumes, then I can't say that it was homicide. Could say that it was manslaughter. Maybe third degree, I guess, because maybe he was. It's the injuries that he had on him tells me that he was in a fight. But if somebody wanted to murder somebody, they would murder them without question. Shoot them in the face. Strangle them. Stab them. If you're going to stage it to look like a suicide, why are you going to use gas cans and inhalants? That makes zero sense, right? So although I said that he was, something happened at that apartment complex, and I still believe that. I still believe that the answer is there. Because it makes no sense to drive him dead back in his car to place him there. Now, maybe they were somewhere else and they drove back together. Well, somebody had made mention that it looked like he was in the passenger seat, leaned over. Well, listen, that was that photograph was from a recreation. I, that wasn't the actual photograph, so I don't know how he was. All I heard from his brother was that he was slumped in the front seat. Now, if he comes back to that apartment building, that complex, I, I can see that. I can I, I can visualize that. 
alive, not dead. I can't see them bringing him back, leaving him in that car dead. It makes zero sense. You would just leave him where he died at. But again, that phone call that he got at 2 o'clock or whatever it was in the morning, and him leaving, I have to know if he left wearing those sneakers, or I mean those slippers. That's important to know. Because that means he's planning on coming right back. Uh, he's not going far. Now, could that call have been from somebody in a different apartment building? Sure, it could have been. Right down, you know, from a, a different apartment. Okay, let's think this out. He certainly could have got a call from somebody that said he was out of gas. Somebody has to know where that gas can came from. His mom had to have been asked that question by the police. I don't know. Would, would you keep a gas can in an apartment building? I mean, in L.A.? Where do you keep that stuff? You know, here in the mountains of central Pennsylvania, I have a barn. I have a shed that I, I wouldn't keep gas with a gas can inside my house. So where did it come from? See, I think there's answers out there. And I think those answers could get us to the truth. But the bottom line here is, I think I jumped the gun in saying that this was a homicide. And the reason I'm saying this and I'm bringing it to you is because I'm not one of those people. I'm not one of those people that makes assertions without sound evidence and judgment. I can say, hey, I, I feel, but I don't like doing that. And I think in my video, I said, I feel that this is a homicide. I'm going to backtrack on that. I think th there was some sort of altercation uh, because of his injuries, but I have got to go with the med medical examiner's ruling of autopsy and say, you know, he died from inhaling that, if that's what it said. If that's what it said, that's what it is. Or it's one of two things. He's corrupt and he's covering something. And I, I doubt that. I don't know the guy. But right off the bat, I'm going to say that's not probable. Or two, he's incompetent and he made a mistake. I mean, yeah, anybody can make mistakes. I make mistakes all the time. But I don't know what his reputation is as a medical examiner. And I'm not going to discredit him based off of just my, you know, two-day, three-day research on a case. Uh, I shouldn't and I will not do that to somebody's credibility. So until I hear more, I'm not ashamed to say I don't know. There's nothing wrong with that. There's nothing wrong with that. I don't know. I think if some questions get answers to them, you know, we'll be able to figure out a little bit more and we can revisit this again. It doesn't matter if we revisit it a hundred times. As long as we get it right. If he was wearing slippers when they found him, that changes a, a little bit there because that just means he was comfortable, he wasn't going far. And to be honest with you, it leads credence to him dying accidentally. Or I guess it could be by his own hands. Although, why would he choose that method? But I've seen people choose very weird methods to kill themselves. Um, but nothing in his victimology said suicide. So, you know, just like the medical examiner when he changed it to accidental death. Very well could have been that. 
Very well, but I would want to know about those injuries. I got to know about those injuries. The petechial hemorrhaging. The bruises. The cut on his head that his brother Randy, I think it was Randy, said. I, that screams fight, obviously. It's such a weird case. Oh, it's maddening. I just watched the stupidest show. And you guys will probably disagree with me, but... I just finished watching The Watcher on Netflix. It started off so good. And then the last like two or three episodes, I was like, I was ready to turn it off, but I was already invested. And I was like, I already watched four episodes. I got to finish it. Not impressed. I love that actor though, especially if you guys ever get a chance to watch Vinyl. It was a HBO show that Bobby Carnival was in about music in the 70s. And he was a music agent, producer, whatever. Great show. Great show, so go watch it. But anyhow, the watch was dumb, uh, in my opinion. And it drove him mad not knowing who sent those letters. And I, I'm the same way about this case now. It's been a week. I keep thinking about it. Some cases just come and go. You know what I mean? They, uh, You do them, you do an assessment. They stay with me for a day, and then I move on. This one, I can't. It's maddening. It's stuck in my brain. Why is that? I got to figure it out. That's what my brain tells me. My whole being is like, you got to figure this out. Come on. It ain't that hard. So many questions. I just need more access to, to things. And that, and, that's, and that is very truth, a lot of truth to that statement because when you don't have access to police reports, autopsy reports, crime pho photographs, videos, and stuff, you are behind the eight ball. And you are. You're, you're, you're swimming uphill in a current because it's difficult. But sometimes that's what you have to do. And you'll be wrong just like this. You can be wrong. Because then you get something, oh, that's right. That makes sense now. I wonder if his mom just missed that car being out there. If that car was there the whole time. You know, I'd want to know. How many times did she check on it? What times? Did he park in the same parking spot all the time? How big was the parking lot? Was it underneath a tree? Uh, were there other cars beside it? Whose cars were they? I'm, I'm sure the police did all those and asked all those questions. I would hope. The thing is, if this is not a homicide investigation, this is an accidental death or suicide, the police report should be available. Right? They, they got to be out somewhere. The, the family has to have requested them. Where are they? Now, if there was no police reports done, period, um, <laughs> we got a problem. You know, this might be a case that I just, I, don't, I dig it, I keep digging, and I go and get answers. I, 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 it might be that. It might be that. This might be a case where I start making a, a little bit of noise. Haven't done that in a while. Shake some trees. Ruffle some feathers. Be the hated guy again. I've been that. People don't like when you start uh, uncovering the past. Yet it can't be just for me. The, the reason I do that for people is for the victims and the victim's family. So, yeah. If I hear, if I hear from Bobby Fuller's family, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ruffle a few feathers. I'm going to make some stuff happen um, for them. I will certainly do that. It's, it's one of those cases that is just sticking with me. So, 
You know, you have to understand. Remember I said before about how you don't want people talking down to you. I'm a big proponent of people not, you know, being all professional and stuffy in their suit and ties and talking down to you and lecturing you. And that's why I do this because uh, I, I don't want to be that type of person. I was that type of person. Or I pretended to be that type of person. You know, I was always uncomfortable going to conferences and universities and lecturing. And every day, of course, as a detective, you know, where I wore a suit and tie to work. I don't like that. I like this. T-shirts. Well, this one has sleeves on. Normally I don't, but um, you have to be comfortable when you're talking about this stuff and comfortable when you're investigating it. Now, I would never wear a cutoff shirt or a T-shirt like this when I interview a family member. Never. And the Hunt for the Zodiac, they tried to get me to do that when I interviewed Sherry Joe Bates's brother and I wouldn't do it. So I put on a, uh, a suit jacket and that's out of respect. But, but the point being is, you know, I am, I am considered one of the foremost experts in cool cases and all this bullshit, all these titles that don't really matter. Um, but I've, I feel that I've worked with the best people, you know, I've consulted with the best people and, you know, they may consider me one of the best. I consider one of them the best. It's all of us together that can make things happen. For instance, if I was to take this case further and I got the autopsy report, like I said, I would give that to two people that I trust right now, Warner Spitz or Dr. Cyril Weck, and get their opinion. I've worked with them hundreds of times. And they would let me know what they think. Then, if they say he died of this, inhaling gas, I'm taking the word for it. Okay? And then we have to figure out some things of what else happened. But that's the first thing that I would do. Um, after 20-something years of working cold cases and FBI and all this stuff that I've done in the professional people that I have met doing this. That's why I created the ASOC, you know, was to get all those people together and, and to come up with solutions and to be considered one of the best in the business of cool cases. It's very humbling because I am working beside who I think are the best, you know, Dr. Henry Lee and, you know, Jim Clemente and Bob Keppel, Mary Ellen O'Toole, um, all those people that sent me books. Together, we should be able to figure this shit out, right? We're the best in the business. We should be able to figure this out. So, it's my hope that Bobby Fuller's family watches this and gets a hold of me. Because I think it's important to dig a little deeper. But I just wanted to make this video to revisit this and say, hey, I'm going to stay in my lane a little bit more and not question that autopsy report because I'm not a medical professional. I'm just not. Now, I can question the injuries that he had besides the inhalation, and I can question things about his dress and the vehicle and, and all the investigative aspects of it. But when it comes down to if the medical examiner said he died from inhaling gas, I'm going to take his word for that until I see otherwise. That's why I want to make this video. Okay? Nothing wrong with that. Hey, until next time, you know what it is. All right? Mains out. Yeah.